Good morning, all. Welcome to our big ideas session, winning over your customer uh, at every touch point in the shopper journey. My name is Alex Belante. I'm a managing director and customer identity leader at Deloitte. Um, I am very grateful to be here in person and be joined by some of our esteemed uh, panel members. Bill Bennett from right to left, VP head of e-commerce at Kroger, Casey Charette, VP of e-commerce at GoPro, and then Shani Gadot-Klinger, VP of customer growth at Riskified. In the, um, we'll jump right into it. In the past year, retailers clearly faced economic headwinds um, against the backdrop of unpredictable virus and its, uh, its resurgent variants, and yet retailers remained resilient, managed to grow in these unprecedented times, even able to respond to consumer expectations. And what we found and saw was a driving factor uh, to be e-commerce and digital experiences. And so with that uh, macroeconomic environment, both in the U.S. and globally, um, I'm curious to hear how you're thinking about things differently this year as you set the agenda for your organization. Maybe start with Bill. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's interesting. I think the biggest shift that we've seen in grocery is how customers are responding to all the inflation that we see happening in the market. And for Kroger in the grocery industry, we see those customers looking for savings in a way that they've, they've never done before. We have a tremendous digital coupon platform that has seen um, strong double-digit growth in, in traffic and in clips. And, and you see really customers looking for savings in every possible arena. What we're really doing is thinking about how do we examine end-to-end -end the customer journey that um, the customers are following as they're looking for that saving. So everything from you know, smoothing out the whole digital coupons clipping experience and reminding customers when they have those coupons clipped and, and need to get that savings. We're thinking about how do we make the, the online um, sort of UX more similar to what a customer experiences in store. So think about similar color schemes, similar um, you know, shapes and cues that sort of point the customer to those savings so that they can uh, really highlight and understand where they can find those. And lastly, I'd say, you know, historically Kroger's been so good about, um, as, as a promotional retailer, highlighting to the customer on their receipt in store how much savings they're getting. Online, we haven't focused on that as much in the past because it's been more of sort of a, online grocery's been more of a convenience service, right? As customers are shifting their perspective more to savings, every time they check out, we're really hitting them with all the th ways that they're saving money with Kroger between coupons and fuel points and their plus card savings and all those different pieces. So we find that the more that we sort of lean into that trend with customers and help them see the savings that we can deliver, the more we grow loyalty and stickiness and repeat with us. Makes sense. Casey? Yeah, so what a couple of years we've had. Um, I think, you know, if the question is how are we thinking about things and, and doing them differently, we're doing everything differently and you have to. Um, the fact that we are living through a global pandemic there is a war going on in Europe. We're experiencing supply chain disruptions. Um, all of these are things are new, and I'm pretty sure there's probably very few people in the audience who've lived through all of these things at the same time. Um, we have really been focused on having to develop information and develop tests so that as we're thinking about the next few years and coming out on the other side swinging, how do you take the things that you know about and the things that you've learned and apply that in a really big way? Um, especially important for discretionary goods. Um, I'd love to be in Bill's seat where you've got you know, someone who can come to you, you know, on a weekly basis, but we don't have that luxury. Right. So for us, it's critical to be able to pivot um, and to be able to have data and be able to act on that data and to be able to um, you know, read what's going on with consumer behaviors and response. So for us, um, this has been a couple of years of tremendous change. It's been super exciting. We've learned a lot um, and we've learned how to be faster and better. So for us, that's going to be key as we hopefully come to the other side of this. Yeah, coming out swinging, like you yeah. said, Shani. Well, um, just like consumers are looking to save cost and money, um, so are our customers and merchants that may be operating on leaner budgets this year. And saving costs is actually what Riskified has always been about. Um, we help lower the cost of fraud for our customers. We help increase their revenue by 
in approving all the good orders and legitimate ones. So in that sense, we've always been a revenue enabler. And in these times, that's even more critical and even more important. So as we're thinking about this year, it's actually just continuing doing what we've always done. Um, make sure that we continue improving our platform and our technology to provide the best kind of results and the most accurate results for our customers and continue to partner with our customers to find even more ways to optimize cost and lower cost um, in areas that aren't necessarily fraud. So an example around uh, refunds or returns and other important areas like that. It's great to hear the uh, vision and direction and obviously goals you set for the year. I wanna touch on revenue enabler. That's interesting to me looking at something as a revenue center versus cost center. I imagine there are you know, equally high value and high risk touch points in the customer journey. Uh, what are the most important touch points in your uh, organization's customer journey? And then, um, you know, what, what are you doing differently? What, you know, what, what are you doing creatively to solve for some of those touch points? Who's that for? Uh, let's start with Casey first. <laughs> so, I love your socks, by the way. I don't know if everybody can see his socks. They're awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So, um, so what, what are those key touch points? Yeah. Um, so, so for us, uh, our product is, you know, one of high consideration. Um, it's critical. There's multiple touch points. I mean, look, we, uh, everybody talks about touch points. It is certainly a buzzword. Um, but as we think about where the consumer is in their journey, I think it's critical to know why do they come to see you to begin with, right? So, you know, for me, running the direct-to-consumer business, you're thinking about, you know, is the customer coming to you because they um, want research, they want information, they want to find out more. Are they looking from a pricing perspective? Um, is there something that they're trying to learn about content? Um, and, or you know, any one of our other various offerings, right? We have subscription, we have apps. Um, so for us, it is about trying to understand that intent to begin with. Um, I think as you think about the touch points, um, obviously the entire purchase flow is critical. Um, we've done quite a bit to bring information up front. Um, so for us, that is going to be giving information about when can I expect the delivery? What are the costs associated with that? Um, you know, we are a global company, so outside of the US, a lot of focus on you know, taxes and making sure that people understand you know, at the end of the day, what, what are they going to pay? So all of that is really important. Um, it's funny, I think about a really fun example of intent, and, and this will probably apply to some folks uh, here personally. I don't know how many of you have families with kids, and during COVID, if you were you know, registering, we're still in COVID, I guess, but um, as you were registering for your vaccinations, if you had a family and you needed to register your family for the vaccination, um, it was a huge chore. You had to go from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, hope that you could get the times all condensed, re-enter the customer information, the insurance information, the type of the vaccine. And so what I thought was really cool, this last round for our boosters, um, I found that one retailer got it right. And the first question that they asked was, are you registering for yourself or are you registering for a group? And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like yeah. they know exactly how to solve one of the problems that was a big pain point for me. So I give them lots of credit. Um, but I think you really have to know your own customer and you really have to understand what it is they're looking for and tailor your site. There's not one thing that works for everybody. Every, every yeah. site is different. No one size fits all approach, yeah. Bill Kroger, how are you solving for those high value touch points? Yeah, it's interesting, Casey and I manage such different um, businesses because it's, Groceries is a very low consideration business, right? I mean, I think over the course of a year, most customers are only ordering, you know, a total of two or 300 different products. And so you don't do a lot of research, right? You, you build your list, you buy the same stuff every week or every couple of weeks. You're not doing a lot of research when you do your grocery shopping. In fact, I think a lot of customers view grocery shopping as more of a chore rather than, you know, maybe for a GoPro, it's a little more exciting to do that research than it is figuring out what loaf of bread to buy, right? Um, and so we have to really balance our site experience carefully between you know, new customers that are coming into the experience that need to be trained on how to, you know, shop with Kroger and how to navigate our site and our promotions and everything with the vast majority of our customers who know us well, who come in every single week and are placing orders, who really want to get through the experience as quickly as possible, right? 
So we invest a lot in, in what we call Start My Cart, which is just sort of a, a carousel of starter products on the homepage based on what you've purchased in the past. It's all personalized. We get a significant portion of our add to carts from that feature alone on the homepage, right? So it speeds up your whole shopping trip dramatically when you can add you know, 20 or 30% of your basket just from that one carousel. Think about then, the vast majority of, of add to carts beyond that come from search results, which is very, um, you know, very intentional shopping where customers aren't really in a mode of discovery. So you know, the goal obviously is to get the customer what they're looking for as quickly as you can. But what you lose then is that opportunity for discovery. I think all of us have had that experience where you're walking through the store, you, you have an item on your list, but you see an item you hadn't thought of or, you, or there's a new item in a category that you're already shopping and, and you're sort of um, inspired to try something new. In, um, in search results, it's this very careful balance of like getting the customer what they've bought in the past, what they're looking for with, hey, did you know there's, there's something new that you should kind of come and discover, right? Um, so balancing between speed and, and discoverability, and then the last thing I'd say is um, in, in groceries, we talk a lot about our fill rate, right? The percentage of items the customer order that we're actually able to give to them. Um, in groceries, that's a very dynamic uh, figure based on what's in stock at the moment of picking, right? In a, in a business that has such high turns and, um, and difficulty tracking inventory. And so we, we think a lot about how do we fully deliver on what the customer's looking for. It's the biggest complaint customers have in grocery, mm. groceries yeah. online is that they don't get what they order. Across, that's across the whole industry. Um, you know, we've got this partnership with Okada right now where we're, um, we're leaning in really heavily to the build out of our own um, proprietary delivery network where groceries are picked in an automated fashion from big centralized facilities where you're not competing with customers for the inventory that's, uh, that's there in the facility, right? So we can do a much better job of promising that inventory to a customer, getting to significantly higher fill rates, which of course, as I mentioned, leads to higher satisfaction, repeat, and loyalty as well. Makes sense. Shani, anything to add? Um, just that as you're thinking about, you know, the touch points throughout the shopper journey, one of the most important ones, maybe with the highest stakes, is around checkout and the actual checkout itself mm. and making sure that, you know, sometimes uh, when a shopper is at checkout, they can experience friction and that can be due to being blocked, uh, potential fear of fraud maybe, and having friction at checkout can be an absolute deal killer. So you really want to avoid that. And from our perspective, this is kind of the number one priority as we help our merchants and customers to make sure that the good and legitimate buyers are able to purchase on the site, smoothly at checkout, in real time, no issues, and have that great customer experience. Got it. Checkout, I think, is, uh, or I mean, this sort of brings us then to sort of the tail end of the customer journey. When you think about post-checkout, which, you know, uh, is a very, very high value touch point in customer journey, you think about the um, creative approaches to personalization, efficiencies that you can gain uh, with providing a rewarding uh, post-checkout experience. What challenges are you seeing given impact to bottom line with refunds, returns even? Um, what challenges are you seeing with the post-checkout experience and what are you doing creatively to you know, create a, uh, a loyal customer or to create that trust with your customer in the post-checkout experience? I'll start with Bill. Yeah, sure. So we actually just recently introduced our own uh, refund service online that's, that's all self-serve. Right. I think something that's, that's unique about groceries is that you don't get a lot of returns from customers because they changed their mind or an item didn't fit, right? which is kind of a, a lot of the rest of online retail has to deal with. It's generally because as a retailer, we, we sort of mess up along the way. right? Something isn't as fresh as we would have hoped it would be or, or was damaged along the supply chain or something. And so we tend to extend a lot of trust to customers that when, um, when they need or want a refund that we want to take care of them and make sure that we get that to them. Of course, that introduces opportunities for, um, for, for abuse of the feature too, right? So we, we're thinking a lot about the right data science models, the right approach to make sure that we're um, understanding how customers are using the feature and, and that it's being used appropriately. I'd say though that in addition to that, as we think about the post-checkout experience, we think a lot about how to move the customer up the loyalty ladder, right? Again, in groceries, it's, it's not the first transaction you make any money, right? You've got to build a relationship with a customer and get them to come back once or twice a week forever. And so, you know, this, just this last year, we launched our new uh, membership program we call Boost, which um, is really focused on holistically developing that relationship with the customer. 
it started as sort of a, a delivery only membership, which a, a lot of retailers now have. Um, but as we really researched the customer need, we found that you know, delivery is still such a small segment of overall grocery that we had an opportunity to sort of widen the net of customers that would find appeal in this membership program. So we added in a multiplier on our fuel points program. We already have greater than 50% of our customers are engaged in our fuel points savings program. Yep. And so you, know, you take that 50% base of customers rather than you know, the much smaller percent that does grocery delivery, and now um, we give them 2x the, the fuel points on every single transaction. So um, we launched that last summer. It's been a, a tremendous success so far as we see customers grow their basket with us, um, grow their frequency, grow their loyalty, um, and, and sort of move up that loyalty ladder, as I mentioned. It's great to hear. Casey? Yeah. So, uh, so again, very different uh, customer, very different business model for sure. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I should probably say is that, you know, so, so, so critical to make sure that A, you have the inventory and B, you're getting it into your customer's hands. And so thank you for the partnership with, with Riskified in, you know, helping us with, um, with fraud tools. Um, that's that's a key, obviously. Um, but look, our, our shoppers are, are not, um, you know, coming back with the same frequency. So for us, it's super critical to really go upstream in the funnel and to help them get the right product to begin with. Um, so, you know, we have a fantastic subscription program that affords the customer, you know, great discounts as well as a no uh, returns, you know, full refund policy and and. Um, you, can, you can beat the heck out of your GoPro, but um, you'll always have a new one to use. So that goes without saying, which is awesome. Um, but look, for, for our shoppers, getting them attached to the right product to begin with is where we really put our energy. So this year we did a couple of things. We launched a product finder, which essentially is um, like taking quiz. And so you can come in and say, this is what I think I'm going to use this product for. And, um, you know, here is kind of how, you know, I see my usage being. And so what we try and do is to understand through a, a quiz, matching the customer with the right camera, but also the right accessories, right? Um, we find, by the way, our younger folks uh, who are on mobile love that. It's kind of like quick and instant gratification. Um, whereas our, our more mature audience likes one of our other features that we just added, which is shopping by activity. So if you're a snowboard enthusiast or skiing or mountain biking, you can come on the site. And what we've created is a really well curated uh, page with a lot of juicy content. We're giving people um, the help with picking out the right camera, but probably more importantly, even the right mounts and the right accessories to go with the camera. Um, giving them a lot of visual aids so that they can see the product in use and they can see this is the shot I'm going to get when I kind of engage with these. And so all of this work um, is being done kind of upfront so that we don't um, lose the customer, you know, in a post transaction. Um, but I think, you know, very similar to what Bill said, um, we also have a whole series of communications that we use that go with to the customer to help them now. You got your GoPro. Now here's how you use it. Here are some tips and tricks, right? Here are some things maybe that you didn't know about um, either the app, and so you can do your own editing and create, you know, amazing content. Um, or you know, here are some other products they might want to consider. So we kind of try to continue that relationship since we get a one-shot deal at it, um, and you know, we're probably not going to see some of those customers again for a while. Yeah, it makes sense. What a great way to lock down mindshare and increase share of wallet by creating that that personalized experience for your customers. Shani, what's uh, Riskify doing to yeah, clients? Yeah, so um, when you're thinking about post-purchase, what a lot of retailers are doing is offering extremely generous policies for returns and refunds in order to retain their customers and keep them coming back. But that can be very costly. Um, so when kind of doing that, and generally speaking, you really want to know who's shopping on your site and who's buying for you. Are they your most loyal customers? Or do they have any history of abusing the very generous policies that you're offering? Um, or are they maybe resellers that are taking advantage of the promos to actually you know, resell the product for less money? And, and those promos are actually meant for your real, you know, regular customers, OK? So by knowing that um, and making informed decisions, you can assist yourself in saving the cost and I think it's time to kind of make, you know, from the one size fits all policy approach 
to actually tailor it and personalize it for the individual um, in order to kind of mitigate that cost. And something that we're doing at Riskified, we, just like for fraud, we have a solution that helps make those decisions for automated decisions for um, policies and claims. But something that I'm excited to share is that we have a new capability we're launching, which is a dashboard where you can see more information about your shoppers, their identities, throughout all of our merchant network. So you can get all of that knowledge and leverage it to make even better decisions for the policies that you're going to offer and how you're going to approach your claims and make sure that you're actually, you know, spent being more generous with your loyal customers, which is what you want. You want to keep them coming back, but at the same time mitigating the cost that may be associated with people abusing your site. Yeah, I love it. It's this is a very interesting panel for me. Uh, selfishly, is the the cybersecurity guy on the panel because uh, for the first time you have stakeholders who are concerned about the customer experience and friction and equally fraud or high value, high risk touch points in the customer journey, respectively. Um, you know, with that, I want to get some final closing thoughts. I'm sure there are, um, a lot of folks in here would love to hear beyond best practices, some words of wisdom, few nuggets they can take away for their organizations. I had a chance to go around, talk to some companies, and I keep hearing higher you know, lifetime value, uh, increased share of wallet, locking down mind share, net promoter score, obviously, higher net promoter score, building trust, building loyalty. What would be the, the few nuggets, let's say one or two, uh, that each of you would give to our audience here today? We'll start with Casey on this one. Okay. Uh, so you all came here today, this weekend, uh, for a reason, right? And that is to get a sampling of some of the partners that are out there. And so I'm, I am a firm believer in making the most out of your partnerships. So it, that comes, I think, in a couple of different flavors. I think at first with your existing partners, a lot of times you go into it and you're, you've got your eyes on that one solution and that's how they earn the business. And then you don't talk a lot about what the other things are that they're doing or what the other things are that they're working on. And you can get in on the ground floor on some things and work with them to iterate on solutions that will work for your business. So I think it's really, really critical to make the most of your existing relationships. Sometimes leaders forget about that and don't push. And so you know, making sure that you're just connecting and talking with your partners, I think, is critical. Um, but you know, to go along with that, and no surprise that um, you know, testing and learning and optimizing and being flexible and able to move quickly is so 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 important. So, you know, as you're here, there's you know hundreds, if not thousands, of potential partners that are out there. Um, the majority of them offer some type of proof of concept. They will come in and they will bend over backwards to help you to solve some of your problems, right? It requires honesty on both parts. What can you do and what are you looking for to, to find that right match? But I think that's why everyone is here today. So I, I would stress that use the time, talk to your peers, talk to people that you meet, what have you seen that's kind of cool, and you know, go around and, and make the most of it. Um, but be open to the fact that, you know, you just have to continue to move. And I'm also a big believer in, in not being, you know, first out to the market on, you know, and, and chasing bright, shiny objects. Like, it's okay to be a fast second, but, you know, get good information and, you know, get in there and, and try some new things. So yeah, that would make two cents. Yeah. Making meaningful use of your time, Bill. Yeah, it's interesting all the different things you mentioned. I, I don't know that those change much over time, right? Everybody's always going to need to focus on wallet and NPS and, and repeat rate, all that stuff. Um, something we've been thinking a lot about, though, is, is everything continues to change so quickly around us, is getting crisp and clear internally on the objective of our online experience, right? Kroger Ecom is a big business. We're $10 billion, but we got to always remind ourselves that there's also another $110 billion retail business that we need to support. And so, you know, getting crisp on how, how much of our role is selling stuff versus helping the customer prepare for an in-store trip versus navigating an in-store trip, right? all, all different need states that come together in a single, you know, intentionally seamless experience, but can also be overwhelming as you try to throw a lot at the customer at the same time. So, um, you know, thinking a lot about how do you um, get alignment across the organization and what you're really trying to accomplish with your online experience. 
Right, Ren Shani, I know Riskified's got a, a booth out there. What, uh, what, yeah, what uh, advice would you booth, give? Of course, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to hear more, thank yeah. you. Um, just really simple, get to know your customers better, get to know, you know the shoppers better, um, find new ways to do that, continue testing it out, and then take that knowledge and apply it to all touch points in the customer journey to give them a more optimized experience. Great, thank you. Thank you, panel members. This closes out our session on winning over your customer at every touch point in the shopper journey. Uh, I'm sure our panel members will be around for a few minutes if you have any direct questions for them. Thank you for coming. Thank you.